Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the July installment of the Alumni Lunch and Learn series here at the Wilder School. Uh, this series um, is a opportunity for um, change agents and thought leaders and policymakers to provide insights and commentary on relevant topics of the day, like today's topic, Virginia uh, Higher Education, What Comes Next?, with Peter Blake and Dr. Robin McDougall. My name is Stephen Dozier. I'm the Director of Development and Alumni uh, Engagement here at the Wilder School. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few quick announcements. The Wilder School remains at the forefront of our field uh, and continues to rise in the rankings. U.S. News uh, and World Report ranks our school uh, public affairs program at number 39. Uh, placing us in the top 15% of more than 250 schools across the United States and top 50 rankings in four program specialty areas. Now is the time for you or someone you know to earn a nationally ranked MPA degree in person or online at the Wilder School. Please follow the links in the chat for more information. And last but not least, check out our latest Commonwealth poll, uh, which is a trusted source for policymakers and influencers. Uh, a new poll will be released next week featuring Virginia's views on the su Supreme Court decision on affirmative action and college ambitions and their views on costs of uh, higher education in the state. Again, check the chat for links to all the things I've uh, announced here. And now, without further ado, uh, Dr. Gooden, uh, our uh, esteemed dean of the Wilder School, will present our moderator. Thank you so much, Stephen, and welcome, everyone. A special welcome to Mr. Peter Blake. I'm delighted, known Peter for many years, respect him tremendously and his um, outstanding career at Chev. I know he'll be introduced momentarily, I do want to just underscore the importance of today's topic. Um, higher education, I think, is encountering what some have called a perfect storm um, in terms of declining enrollment, um, as well as increasing costs and reduced support from, uh, from state legislatures. So I think these are interesting times as uh, for those of us who are engaged in higher education uh, to be thinking about what is the future of higher education and particularly, what are some concerns facing us here at home in the Commonwealth of Virginia? So no one better to moderate that discussion than our Associate Dean of Research and Outreach, Robin McDougall, who leads our great work on the Commonwealth Poll here at the Wilder School and uh, is, is very conversant on matters related to the state of Virginia. So Robin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dean Gooden. It's truly my honor uh, and privilege to introduce today's speaker. As Susan mentioned, I too have had a great relationship with, with Mr. Blake. So Peter Blake joined the State Council for Higher Education for Virginia uh, at first as the interim director in 2011, and then became the director in January of 2012, while previously serving also as the associate director for the State Council on Higher Education in Virginia. Prior to becoming the director of CHEV, Mr. Blake served as the legislative financial analyst for the Virginia General Assembly's House of Delegates Appropriations Committee, was the deputy secretary of education and then the secretary of education under former Virginia Governor Mark Warner, and was the vice chancellor for the workforce development services for the Virginia Community College System. Mr. Blake has served on boards of organizations, including the Education Commission of the States, the State Higher Education Executive Officers, LEAD Virginia, the Richmond Public Library, the Virginia Early, the Virginia Early Education Childhood Foundation, and the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. He completed the Virginia Executive Institute, which is housed right here in the Wilder School. So we consider him a part of the Wilder School alumni family as well, along with completing Lead for, the LEAD Virginia program. He also completed the Associates Program through the National Center for Public Policy and Higher Education and the Executive Program at the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. 
Mr. Blake holds the Bachelor's of Arts and a Master's of Science degree from Virginia Commonwealth University. And in July of 2022, Mr. Blake was honored with the Exceptional Leader Award for the State Higher Education Executive Officers. As you can see, we have a true expert with us today to speak about higher education and the state of higher education in the Commonwealth. Peter, the floor is yours. That's super. Thank you, Robin. That was um, excessive. I really appreciate it. And Dean Gooden, a real pleasure uh, to accept your invitation and to be with everyone here today. Um, you talked about being a true expert. Um, I'm, I'm at this on this call today. I'm, we're surrounded by experts, and I'm looking through the list. I see a lot of friends, a lot of people who are uh, have done a lot of very valuable uh, uh, work in public sphere for a long time. So I want to spend. Um, less time talking and more time hearing, uh, just so we can all educate one another on these important issues. So thanks again for the opportunity to be with you today. And I'll skip through a, a few slides here. Uh, before I do, let me just talk a little bit about the perfect storm that that the Dean mentioned at the beginning. And, and it is true, we've been talking about this for a while, the, the kind of three factors that we see pretty regularly that are conspiring um, um, in, in a, and I hope will be a constructive way. And those are some of the demographic changes that we're experiencing, and we'll talk more about them in a little bit. Uh, but that also includes the fact that some of the fastest growing populations, uh, new, new Virginians, uh, racial ethnic minorities, uh, minority students, uh, uh, first generation students, low income students, some of the fastest growing segments of our population that need more, that we need to involve more deeply in higher education are those that we historically have served less well. So we have a challenge around demography at the same time that where there's a tremendous need for education beyond high school. High school is no longer the finish line. Uh, Georgetown has reported that over 90% of the jobs, new jobs, not replacement jobs that were created since the 2008 recession required some kind of education beyond high school. So uh, there's greater need for more people to have higher levels of education. And then the cost issue um, we have, and the cost pressures are on students, on families, on uh, the question of, of value and, and return on investment. So uh, you have the, the, the pressures not only on the student and the family, but also uh, from the taxpayers, how much how much tax money can you continue to put into higher education? So those are those are the the three forces that continue that persist um, and, and create some even more daunting challenges here over the next X number of years. And, and so uh, we need all of us to be thinking together about how to address those in, in creative and effective ways uh, in order to sustain uh, our lifestyle, our, our society, the things that, that, that we uh, value in, in our communities. So uh, what we'll do today, uh, just a little bit about where we are. I'm going to talk about higher ed governance, uh, some about the statewide strategic plan, and then we'll get into the, the what comes next, the upcoming milestones and some hot topics. And we'll do this quickly just so we can get to your comments and questions. Just the landscape real quickly. This is who we are across the Commonwealth, um, uh, the established institutions, the four-year universities, uh, a robust public two-year institution system through our community colleges, uh, a number of well-regarded private nonprofit institutions, and then a whole realm of out-of-state and for-profit entities and vocational institutions, hundreds, hundreds, literally hundreds, um, mostly in the, in the more densely populated regions of the state. Last year, we awarded 128,000 degrees and certificates. If you talk about workforce development and what fuels the economy in Virginia, every year, year after year, 128,000 people come out of our colleges and universities further prepared to do more, more things and more valuable uh, contributions. This includes everything, two-year, four-year graduate, uh, as well as uh, both public and private. Um, you see that our four-year graduation rate is second in the nation. Um, that's one reason that we believe that we are a very efficient system in Virginia. So if you look at various uh, calculations of our, of our funding, uh, general fund, or tuition and fee revenue, we find that because we have this high graduation rate, the cost per degree, if you want to express it that way, is lower in Virginia than in most other states in the nation. 
uh, public-private four-year, two-year, we're enrolling over a half a million students, 519,000. You see the median wages of all graduates of all bachelor's degrees and a few other items there. I'll note that the debt number in the lower right-hand corner, that's been going down after rising for pretty much most of, uh, of my career. It has leveled off and began, begun to decrease over the last couple of years, which is certainly good news. Uh, why do we think higher education is important? I'm speaking to a to an audience that I, I don't need to spend too much time on this, but these are some of the some of the facts that we uh, regularly cite as why higher education is valuable not just to the individual but to our communities. A little bit of return on investment. This is some work that the Weldon Cooper Center uh, did, and my understanding is that we are going to be getting some updated figures that look just as positive, uh, probably in September or October. So keep an eye out for the the, the fit financial return on investment uh, to the entire Commonwealth. A little bit about governance. Uh, we are a decentralized system in Virginia, as you know. So each in, every university has its own board of visitors, which is the primary governing body of the, of the institutions. CHEV is what's called a coordinating board. So we have um, certain uh, 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 authority that's granted to us through the Code of Virginia. And then also we have some, uh, I guess, implied authority through our credibility and through the reputation of our work. Um, we work very closely with the governor and the General Assembly. Uh, the governor, of course, appoints your board members, appoints our board members. Um, and we're in a period of transition. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, uh, so there's the governor is certainly one of our stakeholders. The General Assembly is also a, a major stakeholder in our work. We also work very closely with the institutions, boards of visitors, and you see a list of their responsibilities. And then you see uh, how Chev fits into how Chev fits into the picture. And I'll just note that that first bullet under Chev developed statewide strategic plan. Chev was created in 1956 during a period of great growth in higher education. You had the GI Bill, you had, you had uh, Sputnik and competition for science um, uh, and technology lead. And so a, a lot of interest in higher education and the role that it could play in, in, in advancing our, our country. And so General Assembly's legislators across the country created organizations like Chev to manage that kind of growth. So it so it could be done efficiently in, in a way that maximizes uh, the scarce resources that are available to it. The number one duty for Chev in 1956 is the same number one duty as it is today, and that is periodically to step back, look a little bit beyond the horizon and develop the statewide strategic plan. And that plan, the current plan that we approved in 2000, uh, 2021 is called the Pathways to Opportunity. And you see the mission and our overall vision is to be the best state for education. And one way that we measure that is, is by educational attainment. And so we have done some calculations. Of course, they can be modified and updated that said that if we have 70% of our working age uh, adults in Virginia with uh, some kind of workforce uh, a, 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 um, a certificate of value, some kind of education of value or a degree, if you have 70% of that working age population by 2030, we would be at the top of the list in the nation of, of being um, uh, the most educated, the state with the most number of citizens with uh, uh, an advanced education. And so that that is our target, the 70% educational attainment. There's all kinds of numbers underneath that and within that. Um, it's not just about the numbers, it's about the type of degrees, about the relevance of those degrees uh, to, to the labor market and a whole range of issues that, that are wrapped up within that 70%. But just step back the kind of the big picture to have 70% by 2023. These are students, I think I calculated the other day, the class of 2030 are something like eighth graders now. Yeah, it would be eighth or ninth, and maybe ninth graders now. So if you have a ninth grader, you're you you are responsible for making sure that we reach this uh, educational attainment level. 
the why, uh, we've pretty much made the case on, on why we need to do these things. We talked about the perfect storm and the challenges that are facing us, but we also then, um, in order to advance Virginia through higher education, we need to be more equitable, more affordable, and continue to be transformative. And so you see some of the some of the supporting uh, numbers and, and, and documents that go with that. So what we do in order to do that, and you can see a little more detail here on what each of those mean, our, our emphasis on, on being more equitable is closing attainment gaps. And the, uh, the attainment gaps for, by race and ethnicity are well documented. There are also attainment gaps by income, by disability status, by the region of the state in which you live. So a range of gaps, we will not reach the 70% if we allow those gaps to persist. So uh, when you're making resource decisions, when you're looking to set priorities for certain kinds of uh, initiatives, uh, you look at which ones might be most effective in closing some of the well-identified and well-acknowledged uh, uh, gaps. Of course, we need to be affordable. Uh, there are many ways. Affordability, as I like to say, has many parents. Um, certainly, sometimes the institutions like to say that it's the state's responsibility for funding institutions. Uh, the state likes to say it's the institution's responsibility to maintain tuition. Um, of course, it's also a student's responsibility to choose responsible pathways through education, to complete in, in as timely a manner as they possibly can, to uh, perhaps start at a community college and transfer to a university, to choose a course of study that um, is, is relevant and meaningful and will provide for some kind of return on investment. So there's many people who are responsible for the affordable uh, a plank of this plan. And then certainly being transformative. And this takes into all kinds of takes into account all kinds of things that universities do, not just um, providing undergraduate education, but what you do in your communities um, uh, through your research programs and other other kinds of, of activities. And of course, VCU, um, with a with a hospital and a, and a major medical school and many professional programs also plays a huge role in in transforming our communities, transforming individuals, um, and in fact families and generations. So that's also uh, a key element of our plan. So of course, this is where I often pause when I talk, and and but I'm not going to do it today because I want to run through this and get to the end. Often where I would pause and say, what did I miss? And, and um, usually the, the audience where I'm addressing this is rich with ideas of things that I missed. And so uh, be thinking about things that I missed. What, what are some of the competitive pressures? What are some of the threats or opportunities that I've not included in the plan? Where are places where we should be looking? Um, I anticipate that in the next two years or so, we will be um, um, refreshing this plan. And so beginning to think about uh, what comes next is certainly a valuable part of, of this discussion and you can contribute uh, to our thinking uh, with your comments and questions today. So just a couple of up, upcoming milestones. So this is beginning to get into the looking forward phase of the talk. Um, we have what's called uh, six-year plans. And this is a, a process that we go through at the state level and you go through at the institutional level every two years where you develop plans that are responsive to instructions that we have developed in cooperation with the governor and the General Assembly. Um, and so those uh, 60 plans, you're in the process right now, you just submitted them, I believe they came in on, on July the 17th, they're followed by uh, regular with meetings we'll meet with every college university between uh, now and September, uh, what we call the OP6 group that's made up of the Secretaries of Education and Finance, the Director of the Department of Planning and Budget, the, uh, the two directors of the Money Committees, the House Appropriations Committee, and the Senate Finance and Appropriations Committee, and, and the CHEV Director. So we will have those plans coming up. Uh, those are intensive sessions where we all get to hear uh, the institution's plans, and and then the institution gets to hear feedback from um, truly the the relevant policymakers that will be instrumental in advancing uh, the proposals that the institutions are bringing forward. This is also a period of time where we'll be going through our enrollment projections, and I have several slides on that just because it has become a topic of a lot of interest. Uh, notably because of the, um, the anticipated decline in the number of high school graduates that we're expected to see in Virginia and across the nation uh, over the next 10 or 12 years. So we have about 90,000 high school graduates now, and that number will dip down to uh, something in the lower 80s 
uh, by 2035. So how do you plan for that? Um, higher education across the nation has has for generation been in a, a growth mo mode. So all of our resource decisions, program development decisions, capital outlay decisions, uh, hiring, uh, a whole range of, of, of policy and practice has been uh, uh, determined by a growth model. And now we're going to be in a in, in a in a less of a growth and maybe even a declining uh, uh, number of students who are enrolled over the next 15 or 20 years. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We do have budget development coming up. Um, this is, will be a biennial budget. What makes this one particularly important and unique, it's the only one in a governor's four-year term that a governor initiates and then shepherds through to the end. So a biennial budget, the, the budget that Governor Youngkin uh, came in with was, was last set by Governor Northam. Uh, and now this will be the first one for Governor Youngkin where he will ha have an opportunity to to shape it um, in in uh, the priority areas that he wants to pursue. So that's coming up. And then new board abortments we already mentioned a little bit. So let me just step through this real quickly on a couple of topics, and then we will get to some questions. How am I doing? All right, Robin, OK. Um, so the six-year plan process, I'm, I mentioned this is um, intensive uh, sessions with all the universities, with um, with the community college system, and we have shaped this year's instructions to the institutions around these three broad issues. And so I'd be interested in um, your feedback on whether or not you were involved in your plan at your institution, how you're thinking about it. So one is enrollment, and we've already talked some about enrollment, so that's going to be a key area. Um, institutions are submitting their enrollment projections, and if um, you know, are, are they realistic is, is really going to be the question. Um, and if they're ambitious, given the clouds that we have described, um, how, what how, what are your plans for achieving them? And and can you actually accomplish what it is that you say that you're going to do? And how can we help you um, make sure that you reach those targets that you have set? Uh, a second topic of interest this time around will be about program alignment and performance. So a lot of uh, questions coming up about um, a return on investment, whether graduates are uh, being employed, or are they getting jobs that pay living wages in their field of study? This gets to that return on investment question. It also gets to a question that we're hearing quite a bit around Capitol Square these days about um, uh, focusing, ha having institutions focus on those programs that uh, offer the greatest return for their students and their graduates. So if VCU has a program that's particularly successful in employment, return on investment, low debt, et cetera, um, then it, it, it might stand to reason that VCU would want to pour more resources into that program and fewer resources into programs that do not have that same kind of return on investment. This process certainly will raise those questions and will cause institutions and state policymakers to address them in, in one way or another. So you can expect some discussion at your campus, at your institution uh, along those lines. And finally, financial effectiveness and, and, and stability. That's the third major focus of this year's six uh, year plan process. And this comes up again in part, of, you know, if, if indeed because of uh, enrollment decline, potential enrollment declines, there may need to be some retrenchment. And so, do you have a plan to be financially stable through some of the changes that we anticipate uh, uh, for VCU and the other institutions? So that's the big focus around six-year plans this year. On enrollment, these are just some of the questions Chev created. The council created a an ad hoc committee back in January. We uh, conducted two years or two months of intensive work, and these were some of the kinds of questions that we asked. I won't go through them, but there's two pages of them. You can go to the second one, Katie, and and these are were just some of the kinds of questions that that we were asking, and we gathered a a, a, a lot of data, presented this information to our council. And in our budget and policy recommendations that we make later on this year, we will have some features of, of uh, this topic um, included in our recommendations for what we think Virginia might want to consider um, in the next General Assembly session. Here's the big picture. Top line is four-year institutions. These are public institutions and their um, total enrollment, undergraduate and graduate. 
you can see the leveling off at the at the at the four year institutions and then a steady decline among the uh, community colleges. Historically, the community college enrollment is counter cyclical to um, to the labor market, to the um, the economy. So when the economy is good, people go to work. When the economy is less good, people go to school. And so that's what we've seen through the community colleges with uh, a run up, particularly after the 2000, you know, during the recession, five, six, seven, eight, and that period reaching a peak in 2010, and now back down to where we were almost 20 years ago in the community colleges. Big picture. Now we'll look at VCU in the next slide. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with these numbers. Um, and this is broken down by undergraduate and graduate over the same period of time. Uh, a lot of growth at VCU over a period of time. That growth has diminished some in the last uh, several years, as you see here, and you're familiar with at your institution. So this is where it, it starts to get real, OK? So these are a couple of projections, and we have two different ones. One is the Western Interstate Cooperative for Higher Education, WICHE, which does projections for all the states on their number of high school graduates over a period of time. The WICHE numbers include graduates from private high schools. The Weldon Cooper numbers do not, OK? So they're a little bit lower, and also they have a slightly different methodology. So, but you see in the two projections, these are the number of high school graduates. Um, I, I mentioned the 90,000 dropping down to about 82 that you see those two numbers on, on this slide. So we have a little bit of a bump up here in the next couple of years. So I guess the caution is even if, um, don't, don't, don't think that's going to last, okay? You gotta take the longer view here. And so the kind of planning that we're beginning to do now around this is really looking out beyond 26, 27, 28, when you see a, a pretty stark decline in the number of high school graduates. Our numbers, even as they level off, the drops that you see in Virginia are not nearly as severe as you see in um, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, uh, Illinois, many of the, the northern states. Uh, and, and that's significant because those are states that our colleges and universities, public and private, traditionally have gone uh, to to recruit students when we recruit students from out of state. Those states are facing steep declines. Where you need to go to find students today are, are Florida and Texas and 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 a couple of uh, other states that are growing um, a lot more than the northern states are growing. So hold this slide in your mind as we look forward at the next couple of ones. This is a, a, a real concerning slide too. This shows um, enrollment uh, participation rate. So we steadily, steadily, we're at 70, 72%. That's the, the black line uh, across the top. And so of those 90,000 high school graduates, how many of them went on to some sort of post-secondary education in Virginia or in another state? This is in all Virginia enrollees, but this is public, private, in-state, out-of-state, four-year, two-year. 72%, kind of the steady number. And then um, you can see the numbers just have gone down since then. We're at about 65%. So there's something, and, and in order to get to that 70% educational attainment that I mentioned, that number needs to be closer to 75%. That's why closing the gaps, reaching new audiences has to be a part of every institution's plan uh, under, these, under these conditions. Also, what this is talking about is, or what this indicates or suggests, is a question about the return on investment. And so um, this is where cost price uh, comes into the into the picture in a serious way, uh, debt, and whether or not students uh, uh, think that um, getting uh, some sort of education beyond high school has any value. And, and this would suggest that um, there are many who do not think it is, and certainly fewer than there were just five or six years ago. So you combine fewer number of high school graduates with with more people questioning the value leading to a lower participation rate. And, and that's a real challenge, part of that perfect storm that Dean Gooden mentioned. This is um, just a little eye chart to show um, kind of the mix among institutions. And so I'll just call your attention to a couple of couple of slide, a couple of items here. This is the uh, of the your freshman enrollment, first year enrollment, first time in college enrollment. Um, if there are 50,000 students in the Commonwealth going to four-year or going to four-year public and private institutions, which institutions got what share of the, that 50,000 students? And so 
VCU pretty steady, 11%, drop down to about 10%, back up to 11%. So, you know, your, your share of the market at VCU is you know, pretty stable in the 11 to 12% range. Um, look at Virginia Tech. And we heard quite a, uh, quite a bit of concern about Virginia Tech because they um, uh, went deeper on their wait list in 2019 and 2020, and they had got a much greater return. And you can see that they ticked up by two percentage points. <clears throat> and so some of the discussion in the policy circles these days is um, by allowing, and, and we can talk about whether we allow or don't allow Virginia Tech to grow, <clears throat> that has led to enrollment declines at other institutions and, and kind of a corresponding number that, that you know, may be related, may not be related, is, is the private total. So private institutions at the very bottom have kind of hummed along at 14, 15%. The year Virginia Tech bumped up two or three percentage points, the privates went down by that number. So that could reflect a ripple effect. Um, if you don't, if, if you go to Virginia Tech, that means you didn't go to uh, another institution, which means another student um, uh, did not go to another institution. And you have this trickle effect that could have had some impact um, certainly when we're when we're making policy decisions about things like the tuition assistance grant or funding for need-based financial aid or what exactly we want to do around enrollment policy, these issues become re relevant. I just wanted you to have a little bit of flavor of of um, of of some of the issues that that help inform our our decision making. So, um, how does all this come together? The top line is the number of high school graduates looking um, uh, using the Weldon Cooper projections over a period of time, and then and the Witchy projections. That's the top line. the The brown line the, the, at the bottom and the orange and the red. Those are sort of top line and bottom line projections of first time in college students. So the, right out of high school, if you look historically look at 2013 through 21. And in fact, we went back another 20 years previously to look at the ratio between number of high school students and the number of high school graduates who've gone on to college in Virginia within two years. And so that ratio is pretty well defined. And there's a number that we then um, projected on the number of, of high school graduates here over the next 15 or so years. And, and that produces a, a range of this is what we expect your first time in college numbers to be over the next uh, X number of years in total. Now every institution will fit within that, um, and so you know it's a it, you're you're we're going to experience um, a decline conceivably. That top orange line though says if we do things right, if we don't just compete for the same student who's going to go to college anyway, which is a which is a um, uh, 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 an inefficient use of a public resource, in my judgment, um, but use that resource to expand the pie and bring more people into, into higher education and ensure that more people uh, uh, are retained and, and, and graduate, then we can achieve that higher line and be successful in our broader goals. So that's, that's where a lot of our emphasis and focus is over the next uh, several years. So that's what I got to say on, on enrollment. I'll wrap up real quickly. The governor's, and I mentioned uh, budget development. Here are the four, uh, the governor calls them North Star priorities. Uh, there's a whole range of initiatives and ideas and, and, and proposals that fall under each one of those. But you see those four uh, within the General Assembly. It's, it's harder to know. And there are people on this call with a lot more knowledge of what's going on in the General Assembly than I have, but we're going to see enormous turnover, perhaps the likes of which we've never seen, but certainly not for um, decades and decades of the kind of turnover, the number of, of new people who will be in the General Assembly and in leadership positions and on important committees like the Senate Finance and Appropriations Committee. So there's, there's, um, there's a, a lot of uncertainty in, in, in the relationship with the General Assembly in the next biennium. You have 16 board members. Unlike some institutions, you have no special designation. It doesn't say that you have to have X number of, 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 of alumni. It doesn't say you have to have someone with experience in health sciences. Um, it doesn't say you have to have uh, one, one some other sort of designation. 16 broad board members. Uh, you have um, you're split now evenly between between the appointees of the last of the current governor and the previous governor. Governor Youngkin will have four more appointments 
in 2024. So uh, you are beginning to see the shape of of, of policy changes uh, dependent on on the priorities of a, of a different governor. And and so that's certainly part of public life. And all of you have been through this, so you know what I'm talking about. And then we have a new board member orientation program. This is something in statute where we're where every board member is required to go through a new board member orientation program uh, that we lead um, at least uh, in, in their first two years of service. So we'll be working on that. And that's a great opportunity for us to engage with your with your leadership uh, at, at the board level. So those are a few things. Uh, maybe I've sparked a couple of ideas. And as I often say, I get more out of these presentations than you will have gotten out of me speaking. So at this point, I'm excited to hear from, from the audience on, on what you think we missed, uh, where you think we should be going, you know, some obvious landmines, other opportunities. So Robin, thanks. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Peter, and you surely did um, in the presentation spark some great questions. So I will start with some questions from the audience and then also we'll add in some of my own because I'm not going to pass up the opportunity to have you with us to, to not ask some of those as well. But the first question, uh, so how does SHEV work with institutions on enrollment? So we've clearly seen this enrollment trend throughout conversation. You showed some great uh, graphics as well. So how is Chev working with institutions on enrollment, preparing them for the enrollment cliff? Right. Uh, and do you, I'll let you answer that first, and then I'll do the follow-up question. Well, well, our, our we we have worked very closely with the presidents primarily on these issues. Some of your finance officers um, are also aware of of our outreach. Um, we uh, so there's been, in my judgment, a lot of communication with the at the at the executive level on these issues. And it, it is you know, widespread in the literature now. So I, I think it's a pretty well-known fact. Some of these demographic trends are very real. Um, and, and so that's why we have such a focus on them during the six-year planning process this time. Great. And then along with that six-year planning process, how do you all hold uh, institutions accountable to their six-year plan? Uh, when they put the six year, I mean, six years is a long time. So how, right. how do we measure milestones yeah. and hold accountability? Yeah, um, you know, in reality, the six year plan is a is a a two year has a two year window to it, yeah. and and it it really is focused on the upcoming legislative session. Um, occasionally, we'll find in it certain maybe longer term vision that an institution might have, you know, an institution might want to add a medical school or might want to, you know, begin a, a new program in public health. Uh, there might be some things that, that come forward through this process, and it's an opportunity for the institution to test the waters with the policymakers on some big ideas. Um, but mostly the six-year plan is focused on a on a two-year two -year time horizon, and um, it often is directly related to budget requests and initiatives uh, that are coming forward in the next biennium. So, so the window of accountability is a lot shorter than, than six years. Gotcha. So like any good strategic planning, we plan to plan and then we evaluate planning again. So that's it. Um, yeah. Yep. Well, you mentioned the General Assembly and you touched on this a little bit, but we are going into Governor Youngkin's biennium. So it is the opportunity with a huge amount of turnover, as you mentioned, in the House and Senate, even before we get to November, just with regards to retirements. And, and you pointed out something that I think many people um, who don't spend a lot of time down at the Capitol might be overlooking a lot of the uh, heads or, you know, the, the leaders of very important committees are also changing. So there's also a lot of longevity and, and information going there um, that, that's leading with those with those retirements. So what do you see in this upcoming General Assembly session? Um, where do you see the political climate for higher education in Virginia? You know, when the dean kicked us off, she mentioned that that generally the legislators, legislatures around the country are not investing as highly in higher education as we'd seen in the past. And you know, we have this opportunity now with a, a pretty positive economy in Virginia. So wh where do you see the political climate? Right. Um, <clears throat> well, as I said, the General Assembly is less clear. And of course, we'll have elections. And so there's a lot of unclearness <laughs> in that realm right now. So um, which I guess, and again, there's 
there's people on this call who should answer this question. But, um, you know, I, I think that will give the governor a, a little more leverage in, again, uh, you know, depending on, on the election, uh, I don't want to say everything, but it, w within areas that are kind of non-controversial like higher education, and we like to keep it that way, mm -hmm. that this will, the, the governor will have a little more leverage over the budget and some of the initiatives. So, um, and, and what we're hearing from the governor, if you look back uh, on the slides, you'll see the governor's North Star, kind of the four topics. Uh, those are the areas where, where he wants to go. And so it's a lot about program alignment with labor market outcomes. It's a lot of concern about out migration of graduates. And so you might see some initiatives about um, what can universities do in order to keep uh, our college graduates in Virginia. And so that's where you get some conversation around internships and 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 what we call sticky pathways that's a term that that Tim Sands the president of Virginia Tech uses you know are there things that we can do to 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 keep our graduates in Virginia um the governor is very interested in performance so he's less interested in in funding um you know enrollment growth or inflation or faculty salaries or some of the routine things that we've done kind of business as usual core maintenance of our colleges but if there's some um uh, some performance outcome related to uh, labor market needs um, employment outcomes uh, uh, uh stemming migration out migration then there might be some funding associated with that so i think the governor will have some leverage and, and it might be wise for vcu other institutions to look at that north star document and and rethink about your initiatives and demonstrate to the governor how what you're proposing fits into this vision. And, and you might need to tweak it a little bit. You might need to change some of the language around it, but you might be thinking about ways that you can fit that in because I, I'm just thinking that, that the governor's budget is going to have uh, greater leverage in this legislative session than, than might be otherwise. I think that's a great point, Peter, and it really is. And so there's some great opportunity there. And, and thank you for sharing those North Star uh, points, because I think that that can allow all of us on this call to think through that. So you did mention things like internships and, and the role of, of businesses in, in this kind of higher education space. So we know that STEM is important. And one of our um, our listeners today said, but what about companies also wanting individuals who have exposure to critical thinking skills learned in the humanities? Yeah. So how can we modify the traditional split between, as we think of engineering, math, science on one side of the equation, but also highlighting the importance of art, philosophy, and literature as it relates to kind of these overall skills that some of our businesses um, are looking for. And as you mentioned, the governor is very aligned with how we're meeting the workforce demand. So would yeah. Chef have any thoughts on welcoming any of these kind of new degrees or a concept of a blending of an approach in that space? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of discussion in the academy around how do you incorporate some of the, the, those critical thinking skills in all degree programs. Um, and and also the just the the core value of the liberal arts. I mean, I'm, I'm a history major, and um, and so you know, and uh, it's just uh, it's not much of an argument for me to to make that case. And so um, I guess the key is to in all of the programs, be they you know the, the arts and the literature and so forth, um, you have to keep one eye on on the relevance to the labor market. I mean, we, you, you, even as we want to, I had a, a former director at Chev said, um, uh, we need to have bread on the table, but we also have to have roses. And, and I never forgot that because it meant a lot to me. And so, you know, we have to have the roses, but the roses have to get a job too. So um, just having some sort of uh, outlook towards labor market relevance in all of our degree programs, and then making sure that that we're returning the best value possible on every degree. And, and so if it is in the liberal arts, certainly you want that to be the best it can possibly be. Um, uh, uh, and, and we need to be careful that we don't um, spend so much time talking about STEM that we exclude uh, the great value that, that we get out of, out, out of all of our programs across our institutions. So that's a bumbling way to say I'm, I'm all in on the liberal arts. 
not not a bumbling way at all. So let's go to the opposite end of that spectrum. So we're talking about the importance of blending the humanities and STEM into higher education degrees, but we see governors both in this state and around the country that are eliminating the requirement for a college degree for state jobs. How do you see that kind of juxtaposed to this, you know, enrollment question and the future of enrollment in, in colleges and universities when we see, you know, state leaders then also saying, but we're not going to require a, a college degree for state jobs. Yeah, I, um, I, I think that's the right thing to do, um, uh, to not require it. Uh, certainly, it's, it's an expectation for a lot of the professional jobs in, in which we're involved. Um, I, it probably reflects concerns about labor market shortages as much as anything. And we just need to make sure that um, a college credential is not a barrier to getting uh, more people into the labor market. So it, it's probably as much labor market as it is um, any kind of signaling that a college education is, is less valuable than it was before. That, that's a that's a very good point because we are countering that that labor market issue in kind of that same that same space. So when we think about labor markets and we think about that cliff in enrollment that we've talked about, one of the questions that came up from the audience is, do you think that the we're going to have you put your political hat on again, the decline in future high school enro enrollment might inform state officials to look at welcoming more immigrants to Virginia? in an attempt to boost um, the number of young people that are now entering into that K-12 pool, which ultimately would impact and enter into our enrollment in colleges and universities? Uh, I hope the answer is yes. Okay. So, I mean, we saw a, a, a big decline in international enrollment um, mm -hmm. because of a lot of criticism that some immigrants um, endured um, previously. So, you know, maybe we'll have a little bit of a reversal of that um, maybe we can get our international enrollment back up a little bit, and you know anything we can be doing that is more welcoming to to all Virginians, all Americans, is is a positive step. There are communities in Virginia where uh, students at the high school there are ninety different languages being spoken in a high school, and it's not just in Northern Virginia. Oh, yeah, you know, it's in other parts of Virginia, and and you know if if we can't adapt to that and view that as an opportunity um, that we're missing if we're not engaging with these students and just um, uh, you know, pursuing the, the traditional market of students, then, then we're failing. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to be, I think, even more intentional about outreach in places, as I said at the beginning, um, with populations that we historically have served less well. Great point, great point. So in that current space that we're in with regards to the decline in enrollment, but yet you showed data um, about the rise in for-profit and out-of-state schools operating in Virginia, those of us here at Virginia Commonwealth University, an outstanding state institution, should we be concerned at the market share that we are losing in Virginia for the for-profit and out-of-state schools, higher education institutions operating here in the Commonwealth? Um, I mean, you should be aware of it. And, and you might even try to learn from it. Um, some of these schools are um, more nimble. Uh, they uh, can offer programs in different formats. Um, so they, uh, so I, um, there might be some things that we can learn from from the people who are in the in that market, um, it, it's a small element. I think just as concerning or places where you might want to look are in like uh, company sponsored education programs. You know, Microsoft or a Google uh, educational program. And so there, there's the 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 space is rich right now with, as you know, micro credentials and yeah. alternative ways of achieving um, uh, education and training. YouTube videos. Which you know, many people click as as education, yeah, and, and and it's true. I mean, we use it all the time for just in time education, for repairing your car or whatever. So, um, 
there's there's a lot of things out there that are happening. We should be aware of them, learn from them. Um, I don't I don't see it as a as a mortal threat right now, but but maybe I'm naive. Well, no, but I think you make a great point about things that we can learn from some of those more nimble um, organizations or, or or agency institutions of higher education. You know, before COVID, we would see all these online institutions doing amazing work, and those of us in the classroom every day, which were you know ninety five percent of us, and then we wish we had that nimbleness when we had to very quickly quick you know flip to online education so i think the nimbleness is a a great point of something that we can take away from that as a positive of how then also aligning with as you mentioned those those four priorities of the governor and that nimbleness as well um, so I'm going to go ahead and give credit to Bill Lighty for this question, because when I ask it, you will know it has to be from someone who served as the chief of staff to two former governors. But what is the op six thinking about capital construction? So we see buildings across universities everywhere across the Commonwealth, yet we see trends of declining enrollment. So how do those two align with one another? And what's that? Yeah, yeah. About? Chief Lighty. Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, uh, so there's not a whole lot of appetite for capital right now. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that there's over a billion dollars in the pipeline already that's been approved. And the, we're seeing because of inflation and other kinds of cost pressures, the, the, the costs of those projects are increasing 10, 15, 20%. So there's a lot of pressure on already approved capital. Um, that doesn't mean that there are outstanding needs to repurpose existing facilities to add things that would help make a university more attractive to students. And so there might be some you know, selected projects that move forward or get some sort of authorization for planning, that sort of thing during this session. But um, generally speaking, there's not a lot of appetite for, for new capital. As far as it, uh, enrollment declines and, and so forth, uh, only, there's only a handful of institutions in Virginia right now that show any need for new space based on current or projected enrollment. It's like George Mason University and a couple of community colleges. So the, but, but there is need for um, space that is more uh, adaptable to the current ways of learning. So a lot of opportunities for renovation of space, uh, to uh, build a new building that will update labs. I think you have a new science building on Franklin Street. Is that right? We do, yes, that would sir. Certainly, that would certainly fall within that category. I mean, your old science buildings were, were built for a different era, a different kind of learning style, different students, uh, different needs. So, you know, so even without enrollment growth, institutions will be able to make um, very valid claims for why new buildings, renovated buildings are necessary, but there's just not a lot of appetite for it right now because of what I said earlier. Well, that that's very helpful. And as, as you said, Chief Lighty having that, that concept there. So our last, my last question for you um, with our time with you today is one of the challenges you said to us is thinking about that eighth grader that we need to help meet those indicators. But all of people, everyone on here are, are advocates of higher education, seeing the importance um, and the need of the public good of higher education. What would you tell a rising junior in high school today about the importance of higher education? Uh, I would say that um, education beyond high school will allow you to open doors that you won't be able to open without. And well, very, that's a that's a perfect statement that we can all take away because yeah, I think that's but, a great way to state. I mean, you, you you can with it you can go more places than you can without it, and and so um, even if you're unsure about your career trajectory, um, you know, some kind of education beyond high school is going to do you well and will enable you to do things that you're not going to be able to do otherwise. The other thing I would say is that. Um, um, not necessarily full-time enrollment, but continuous enrollment is the key to completion. So don't lose the tether to the institution or an educational institution um, once you get into it. So 
you might burn out, you might not have money, you might have to be taking care of family for a little bit, find some way to stay connected either to that institution, to a community college, something to continue accumulating uh, and stepping towards getting a degree because it's that continuous enrollment that really matters um, in completion. So those would be a couple of things. That's absolutely outstanding. And it gives all of us great marching orders uh, here at VCU to make sure we carry that message forward. Peter, thank you so much for your time. Uh, yeah. Such a timely topic. And thank you for all of your service to the Commonwealth across all of your great. many positions you've had. And for Super being fun. Great, thanks for all the input. Yes. And for being a great alumni of VCU and of the Wilder School. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. I'm going to let the dean come back on here. Thank you so much. Uh, this was just an amazing session. I know that all of us learned a lot. And I think that quote about you can go more places with an education than you can without it. Uh, I mean, it really just uh, sums it up very nicely. So thank you so much, Mr. Blake. Thank you so much, Robin, uh, for getting in so many uh, great questions. And thank you to all of our audience participants for asking such great uh, questions. So I'm going to turn it back over to Stephen to close us out. Many thanks. Thanks, Dean Gooden. And yes, again, thank you to our engaging audience. I think this is a record for a summer session of uh, Alumni Lunch and Learn. So I'm really excited for all the engagement that we saw in the Q&A and in the chat. And uh, thank you again, Peter Blake and Dr. McDougal. Um, amazing conversation here. Thank you to our communications team uh, behind the scenes who's uh, great work uh, allows this to happen. Um, while we're on the subject, we do not have an installment for August. So we look forward to seeing everyone at our September 20th um, installment of the Alumni Lunch and Learn series with Dr. Janice Underwood, who is the director of the Office of uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Office of Personnel Management. Um, we're looking forward to that, and that should be uh, as engaging as today's uh, conversation. Um, thank you again for spending your lunch hour with us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>